Hi, welcome back to 5-Minute Physics. And uh, today I want to talk about what is probably one of the most fundamental results that's changed the way we think about how to understand and calculate in physics. Yesterday I talked about the principle of least time, which was a fascinating and quirky aspect of, uh, of nature. But today, as I indicated, I want to talk about the principle of least action, which is much more fundamental. But I realize it's going to take a lot of action to talk about it. So I've, I've prepared a bunch of pictures as well as so that I won't have to draw them too much, um, although I will do some drawing. In 1744, uh, Pierre-Louis Malpelchius said, nature is thrifty in all of its actions. And that was, and he, he actually put a mathematical bent to that, although it wasn't exactly right. Um, but it laid the foundation at the same time Euler and Lagrange and other people uh, put, put meat, mathematical meat on the bones of this. But basically it said that nature is lazy, that there's some quantity that nature wants to minimize. And that's really a profound result. And, and I have to say, until I prepared this, this talk, I never really thought about, about what action meant or why, why, uh, why it might be called action. What is the action of a system? You know about the energy. We've talked about energy. Total energy of a system is the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Now, the action of a system is related to the difference between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And that's the way we define it in physics, and I kind of accepted that and worked with it, but I never really thought about why it was called action. But if you think about it, there may be, at least I've thought of a way to, to, to understand it, and that is that nature likes to equi equipartition its energy. If there's a certain amount of energy, the world would like to, and there are different ways you can store it in different ways, like kinetic and potential energy. Nature wants there, it's sort of to be equal among, uh, equally partitioned among all the different ways that energy can, can, can be stored. And, um, and any deviation from that is, is, makes the action bigger, and nature wants to minimize. Nature is lazy. Nature, nature says, I don't want much action happening. And, for example, in thermal equilibrium, if assisted, there's a theorem called the virial theorem, which says in thermal equilibrium, basically, the average value of the kinetic energy of a system is one half the total energy. Well, of course, that is nothing other than saying the kinetic energy and the potential energy are roughly equal and the action is zero. So a system that's relaxed to thermal equilibrium in this, in this way, by what's called the virial theorem, has, has minimal total energy. Let's think of another stable system, an orbiting system. As a, uh, in, a, in a future talk, I'll talk about orbits, but, but uh, in an orbit, in a, like the Earth going around the Sun, it turns out that, it, that, in fact, the kinetic energy in an orbit is one-half the total energy. In a circular orbit, uh, let's say the moon going around the Earth, its kinetic energy is one-half the total energy in magnitude. And that means that it's exactly minimized the action. So, that's, so an orbit is about as relaxed a system as you can get. An orbit is basically an object continually falling. Now, um, so basically... What we want to do is take this quantity, the action, which is related to the, to the difference of the kinetic energy and potential energy, and minimize it for any system. And, and in the next few pictures, I, I sort of got this from Feynman, um, although the, uh, you'll see the original idea comes from someone else, ultimately. But let's, let's consider, for example, a, a system where you just have a, a ball rolling on a table, so the potential energy isn't relevant, it's only kinetic energy. And so we know that, it, in fact, from, from Galileo, that if we have a, a, a ball moving on a table, then it's going to move at a constant velocity. Why doesn't it move like this, where it speeds up and slows down and speeds up and slows down? Well, if it's moving at a constant velocity, then its kinetic energy is always one-half mv squared. That's the form for kinetic energy. Okay. But if it's going up, sorry, up and down, then it's, then it's average kinetic energy on that new path is one-half m times the average of v squared. But it turns out that if, if you d depart from a straight line, the average of v squared is always greater. Well, I'll write it down here. The average of v squared is always greater than v average squared. Because the departures from, from here, whenever it's much larger, 
whenever the velocity is much larger, it adds a much, much bigger component than when the velocity is much smaller. Because if it's period, if x is periodically 10, then 10 squared is 100. If it's, if it's periodically 1, you get 1. But the 100 matters a lot more than the 1. So the average for a crazy path of, of the velocity is always bigger than the average velocity, which is the straight line squared. So if the object is going to minimize its action, it's always going to go at a constant velocity. So you can understand why objects go at a constant velocity in the absence of any potential energy. But now let's figure um, the, uh, a system where I'm now throwing something up in the air, which would be good if I, didn't, if I did this right. Okay. Now let's consider a system that I'm, where I'm throwing something up in the air. Now the potential energy of an object increases as I go up in altitude. Okay? So I could go in a straight line, but remember that the action is really up for the for my path is is the sum over the whole path of of this quantity during the path, and um, and so we have potent we have kinetic energy one half mv squared. But remember, there's a minus potential energy now. So what you want to do to be, to make this quantity minimum is you want to get up as high as you can. So that, because originally you've got a, just kinetic energy and, and you've got a large value here, but if you can get up high quickly, then the potential energy will increase and, you'll, and it'll counter the, the kinetic energy. And so the, the ultimate trajectory will be one we, we said, this isn't very, will be a parabola, this isn't a very good parabola, where the object will try and, will, will, the natural motion will be to go up and, and try and minimize this first and then slow down and go down to there so that this quantity is always much, much less than just the kinetic energy alone. So since it can, and that's just because the potential energy increases with, that, with height and therefore you want this, the, the natural, the preferred path will be to go up to get altitude is much more quickly than in a constant velocity, so you minimize this quantity. And again, if you find out you minimize this quantity, you get exactly the result that you'd get from Newton's laws. You get a parabola. So minimizing the action is, is equivalent to what you'd get from Newton's laws. Now, it, it, didn't, it doesn't really necessarily work this way, but it could. That let's just say I considered all different paths I could take here, and I considered the, prob the action as a function of the path. And there's some minimum action. In this case, it's a parabola. Otherwise, uh, um, uh, otherwise, the action is for a different path is much greater. Let's just say I said the probability of, of the particle taking any path is proportional to the exponential of minus the action. That means if the action gets bigger, e to the minus a big number is a small number. And so that means that ultimately, if, if for example, the minimum action were much, much less than the action of every other path, then the only probability that would really matter here is the only probability that'd be greater than zero would be the one for, would be the path that had uh, the minimum action. All the other probabilities would be about zero because e to the minus s for all the other paths would be so, so small, they'd be almost zero, and the only one that wasn't zero would be the minimum one. So if you consider that, then, the, then this would tell you, if you imagine that nature worked this way for, for classical systems, then the classical system would always take the classically preferred path. In fact, in classical mechanics, it doesn't work that way. The, the system takes one path, and there's not a probability of a lot of different paths. But maybe you now see where I'm heading. Because quantum mechanics is different. The whole point I've told you about quantum mechanics is that particles do many things at the same time. And if I measure a particle to be at this position at time t1 and this position at time t2, it can go on a straight line between them, it can wiggle around, it can, go, it can do a, it can do a loop the loop in time and space, it can slow down and speed up, it can do all sorts of things. And in fact, in quantum mechanics, it does all these things at the same time. That's the weird thing about quantum mechanics. But quantum mechanics, t what it does do, and this was a formulation originally developed by Dirac and then refined by Feynman, although the argument I'm going to give you is it is, was first developed by Dirac. And it says the wave function, which is basically the likelihood that a particle will start out at x1 at t1 and end up at x2 at t2, is given by summing over all paths some probability. It's called the probability amplitude. But it's now not e to the minus 
action, it's e to the i action over h bar, where h bar is Planck's constant. Now, this is a very strange quantity. It's very different than e to the minus action. And for those of you who don't know about complex numbers, it's not, you don't really need to know a lot. All you need to know is that this quantity is like a vector, a little vector of unit length. If I draw uh, uh, an axis 1 to minus 1 here and i to minus i here, basically e to the i of the action is a unit vector that points in a certain direction whose angle is determined by the magnitude of this quantity, and it swings around between 1 and minus 1 and i and minus i. Now, this allows us to understand, in some ways, why the classical world results from the quantum mechanical world. Because this is basically, this is, this is the formalism for quantum mechanics that, that Dirac first created and that Feynman demonstrated would allow us to calculate many, many things. But we can understand it. Because let's say that you have a classical system. H bar, which is now we, which is which is a related to Planck's constant, is now the minimum quantity of action that an object can have. In the, it, action is quantized in the quantum mechanical world, and classical systems are simply systems for which the action of the system is much much bigger than H or H bar. Which H bar is just a different way of writing H. I don't want to talk about that for the moment. Now, let's think about this. Let's think about what summing over these paths of this quantity is. If I am at, at the minimum, if the, if, the, if the system, if there's some path that minimizes the action, then the action doesn't change very much around the minimum. That's the key point. And if, therefore, if I consider a whole bunch of paths um, near the minimum, I just add them up, and this quantity has the same value. So the point is that for a classical system of, say, 10 to the 23 particles, the action is something like maybe 10 to the 23 times h bar. And so, so I, have a, I have, say, 10 to the 23 paths that are very, very close to this thing. They all add up the same way. It's like adding up a whole bunch of little vectors, all going in the same direction. And the, and, and the probability will be proportional to the number of different paths I take, but they're all in the same direction. So the, so the probability will be proportional to the number of different paths. But if I'm here, if I'm not at the minimum, then the action is changing if I change the paths. And that means that if I think about it, that means I'm adding up a bunch of paths, but because the 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 the, the direction of, of, of this vector depends upon the magnitude of the action, that means it's like I'm adding up a lot of vectors that are pointing in random directions, and the and the part and, and, and I add them all up and, and they're all going in different directions. And you see, you don't get very far as opposed to that way. In fact, you could say there's a, there's a theorem that if, you, if you're a drunk and you're wandering randomly and you take n steps, the distance you ever make it away from the center is proportional to the square root of the number of steps you take. So now you can see that the probability of the classical path is proportional to n, but the probability of all the other paths, which, are, which have much bigger action, is the square root of n, and the ratio of the probabilities the ratio of the, of, the, of the classical path over all the other probabilities is n over the square root of n, which is the square root of n, and for 10 to the 23, that's like 10 to the 12th. That means the classical path is a million, million times more probable than any of the other paths. And you can therefore see for classical systems how quantum mechanics basically says, yeah, every path can be taken, but the classical, the classical path is the one that will be taken with the probability a million, million, or better, more frequently. Essentially, for all intents and purposes, the particle will always take its classical path. This formalism allowed Feynman to do a whole bunch of calculations and, and uh, that couldn't be done otherwise and was responsible in part for his Nobel Prize. But I like to think that quantum mechanics epitomizes that statement of, of Pierre-Louis Marpertius that nature is, is thrifty in all its actions. Because in this case, in quantum mechanics, the particle does take all, all actions are taken, not just one, but every action that's possible can be taken. But the easiest one is the one that's most significant. And that's how part, quantum mechanics implements the least action principle in, in a very effective way. Everything is possible, but, the, but, the, but, the, but there are paths that are more probable than others, and the ones that are are the ones that minimize the action. Okay, that was a lot, and I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye-bye.